Uh, I'm going to shift uh, the talk. Uh, much of what you've seen has uh, been technical uh, aspects of uh, improving your care and what I call product-specific research, where you look at a spinal cord stimulator device, an RFA device, a, a, a SI joint fusion device uh, for the uh, product-specific research uh, that uh, approve the safety benefit and efficacy of the device. I'm going to shift to talk about registries, uh, registries in the spine arena uh, and in uh, uh, cardiac, orthopedic, uh, general surgery. Uh, are becoming a, a way of uh, seeing about the health and well-being of entire populations, not specific populations that have one particular problem. And the advantage of this is the uh, registry embraces the heterogeneity of the population uh, because people are very diverse and their characteristics uh, are not captured uh, in randomized control trials. In fact, those characteristics, that, that diversity is excluded. That's how you design a randomized control trial, is you exclude variations. So that you just get a pure uh, study group in which you're going to study one thing. And so when we look at how these registries work, they are very much like a GoPro camera captures the entire landscape of what is in front of it, whereas a Polaroid camera captures a single snapshot in time. And the randomized control trial is a single snapshot in time. It's uh, highly constrained in who can get in and who can get out, what kind of treatments are, are being studied. In registries, the entire diverse population who is a candidate for a spine pain intervention, a joint replacement, a colon resection surgery. The entire population comes in and the treatment of that entire population uses one measurement tool. So what you see in the GoPro example, you can see the diversity of the landscape. You can see above into the sky. You can see that it's bright up there. You can see the hillside of the land. You can see the water that's moving. And you can see the darkness and the detail in the water below. All of it is captured. So the registries capture the broad experience. And the Practice of medicine for all of you will be different in that you'll have all of these measuring tools measuring you, measuring your patient's outcomes, and measuring your patient's experience. So the Prescani scores are examples of consumerism measurement. Registries are examples of patient outcome measurement and physician success measurement. And you want to embrace that because those measurements in a good practice are always going to be in the top third or top 10%. So you want to embrace registries. They're enormously empowering. It's a very simple thing to participate in registry. Physicians participate from the perspective of defining the problem and defining the treatment. So physicians participate by the definitions, the metrics that you're going to use to measure. Each of the participants in registry have different motivations or self-interest. The patient wants to get better. The physician wants to retain uh, autonomy and authority around recommendations for treatment. The payers want to be able to budget for an entire population, product and device manufacturers, want to be able to innovate, and that's what you saw all morning, is innovation of new product and new device, and pharma wants to be able to bring new products to uh, the marketplace uh, in a manner that uh, succeeds for their business. So when you're looking at collaboration of these six Ps of physicians, patients, payers, product and device manufacturers, remember that each of them have self-interests, but in a balanced collaboration, you as a physician can serve the interests of all of them. You just need to do that in an equanimous manner and a, a, a transparently uh, truthful, and you'll be very successful. What registries start out with are quality improvement projects. Think of it as um, what Boeing does when it's building aircraft, although its recent history is somewhat 
challenging. Uh, what they do is they try to build the safest, most effective, and uh, reproducible aircraft. And when you look at the airline industry, there are millions of takeoffs per year that go without a trouble. And that's because they do quality improvement. The pilot walks around the plane every time. In the automobile industry, uh, making uh, Toyotas exactly the same every time, making Mercedes-Benz exactly the same every time. And what registries do is quality improvement in the uh, different ways that people take care of patients. Because if you find two ways of doing things, or five ways of doing things, one of them will be the highest quality, and each of them will be ranked by cost. So if you find the highest quality at the lowest cost, you have the greatest value. And value-based medicine is what the next 30 years uh, of the practice of medicine is going to be about, and registries provide that information. So let's look at this roadmap. This is a bicycle uh, uh, Tour de France roadmap, and what you see is what registries do. They embrace an understanding of the landscape. You can see this bike rider has two pretty significant hill climbs before facing three significant hill climbs. So as a biker, you know you have to be able to recover because when you finish with these three, you're gonna be brutally tired. You have a recovery period here before your next two major hill climbs. And that's what registries do. They give you a look at the landscape for all of the variations in that landscape the treatment is going to require. And in knowing those variations, you can find the, the best treatment options that have the highest outcomes. You benchmark those outcomes so that you can measure everybody by the same tool. Now this is an example of registry heterogeneity of care. There's a heterogeneity of the population, all of the diverse types of people who will come in with the problem. There's a heterogeneity of care. And what you see here is many different companies with their different devices. This is the heterogeneity of registry for percutaneous vertebral augmentation. But if you wanted to study radio frequency ablation, the company names would be different, the device names would be different, but they'd be in those same columns. If you were looking at spinal cord stimulation, the companies would be different, the pulse patterns would be different, but they'd be in those same columns. And in that way, instead of doing product-specific research, you're looking at all of the different products that can treat the condition, and you're measuring them with the same yardstick. And what ends up happening, is you find sub-cohorts that do beautifully with a Boston Scientific pulsed and do beautifully with a Medtronic or a St. Jude. And those sub-cohorts come out in the data so that when you see your patient, you know which device would work better for that patient's characteristics. And that's the deep insight of registries. So since you define the metrics, and you're responsible for the grassroots uh, innovation and development, you end up being in an empowered position. Now this is an example of a general surgery registry for doing colon resection. And this is an example of a thing called the Hawthorne effect. And the thing of the Hawthorne uh, effect to remember is that it's very much analogous to shining a light in a dark room all of the things that are important are in the center of the light and all of the cockroaches run to the corners. In medicine, there are suboptimal treatments that a physician doesn't know are suboptimal because his practice is not large enough to know that. And many of the patients don't follow up with you, so you cannot know that. But with registries, you get to see the outcomes of all variations of treatment. So this is one variation of treatment called a leak test when you're reanastomosing a colon. When you've resected colon for cancer or inflammatory disease, you have to plug it back together and you have to anastomose it and the anastomosis has to work in order for the patient to recover. In the state of Washington between 2010 and 2015, the registry just asked the simple question, do you leak? test your anastomosis before you close the abdomen. And a leak test is very much like the flat tire that you see on the bicycle in the background. You used to patch a flat tire by filling it with air after you had patched it and putting it in a sink of water to see if a bubble comes out. 
If it bubbles, then you know you, you didn't patch it well, you repatch it again. For general surgery, they do the same thing. When the anastomosis is finished, they fill the abdomen with water and they charge the anastomosis with air using a rectal tube. And if bubbles leak up from the anastomosis, the anastomosis has a leak. And you can follow the bubbles right down to the origin, put a stitch in there, stop the leak, empty the water, sew the patient up, and the patient does not develop peritonitis. Half of the surgeons in the state of Washington did not do leak tests in 2010 and 2011. All we did in the registry was publish whether you did a leak test or not, and gradually physicians watching the registry realized that patients recover better, safer, faster, have fewer ICU uh, stays and returns to the operating room for peritonitis if you did a leak test. In the state of Washington in 2020, 100% of physicians do leak tests on colon resection surgery. Nobody was forced to do anything. Nobody got lawsuited from this. There were no uh, medical licenses withdrawn. All we did was shine a light on how to do things safely and effectively. So this registry capability occurs for spinal cord stimulation, for percutaneous vertebral augmentations, for spine fusion, for total joint replacement of the hip and knee. This Hawthorne effect increases the benefit for all patients without coercion or retribution. So this is spine fusion among smokers, and what you see is smokers realize that, it, and doctors who do spine fusion realize that smoking erodes outcomes, and there you see the smoking rate drop, and nobody was asked to or forced to quit smoking. They did it on their own. What registries show you is toxic variation, and all of us have variations in practice. You saw many variations in uh, interventional pain procedures just this morning, and when they are tracked in registry, you'll know which one of them works the best and which one has the highest value for the patient. Uh, here we're speaking of a uh, vertebral compression fracture registry that was published uh, by some of the uh, speakers that, uh, today uh, at, at the uh, uh, course. It's the largest vertebral compression fracture registry that's yet been published uh, globally. And it has had enormous impact for physicians, patients, and the payer uh, who is responsible for uh, covering uh, uh, this procedure for beneficiaries. As you can see from looking at the graphs, there is an enormous impact on pain improvement and function improvement. The first graph is the pain, and what you see in the graph is how severely painful they are at nine out of 10. The red aspect of the graph line is the minimally clinically important difference for a treatment to be considered justified or covered uh, and authorized uh, by Medicare. And what you see is there's a three to five fold improvement in that minimally important pain score. On the function, uh, there's a, a two to three fold improvement of that functional score. Patients who have vertebral compression fractures are profoundly disabled, and when they have an augmentation, they are profoundly improved. This data has helped uh, Medicare make fundamental changes to how they uh, reimburse and authorize uh, vertebral compression fracture care. And that kind of change in uh, the landscape has the opportunity to go global and influence the for the benefit of all women with osteoporosis. What registries allow you to do is to see the global practice of medicine, either in your uh, communities or in your nation, and give information to you around the most cost-effective, value-based uh, treatment that you can offer uh, to patients. Once you have large databases with this uh, knowledge, you can then do specific randomized control trials. Uh, so this is a quality improvement data set that can guide your practice. And if you're a researcher, it's an enormous mountain of information that can help de uh, devise randomized control trials. 
What this registry found was that the treatment of patients with vertebral compression fractures using percutaneous vertebral augmentation was incredibly safe. And Medicare had originally been concerned that there was a safety issue, a, a potential for paralysis, a potential for embolism uh, to go to the lung or brain. What they found out was um, there were only two adverse events out of 732 women treated this way. And those adverse events were not related to the procedure, they were related to the patient's age. So it dispelled a myth about treatment that had proceeded for 20 years. It showed to be, the registry showed the treatment to be reliable, safe, and this kind of benefit occurred everywhere the treatment was performed. And it was performed in Washington State, it was performed in Oklahoma, it was performed in Wisconsin, it was performed in California. It wasn't specific to a clinician or an academic center. It was as successful in a community as it was in a tertiary care facility, which means the benefits occur everywhere the procedure is performed, by whomever the procedure is performed. This is uh, the important information of uh, value-based healthcare revolves around the cost of treatment and the unintended consequences of treatment denial. So on the left-hand side, you see someone who is diagnosed and treated on the day that their fracture occurs. Their cost is very low. Their pain severity is very high. Their pain relief is immediate. And their pain relief and functional improvement sustain. So it tells you it's safe, effective. On the right-hand side, you see what happens if uh, there is a delay in authorization, if there's a, a, a denial of authorization, if there's the unintended consequence of restriction of care by the uh, payer, in this case, uh, the Medicare administrative contractors, there's a tripling of cost, but there's still an ultimate benefit. The patients still have disabling disease, so the condition does not get better on its own. Another myth of vertebral compression fractures dispelled by the registry. The pain improvement occurs with the treatment. The improvement is not as much, but it's still significant. Two to three times the minimally important clinical difference. The function return is demonstrable, impactful, and important, but not as much as if you do the procedure early. And you cannot get those insights any other way than with, with a registry. It's the only way you'll get those insights. So it proves the benefit of what you do. It improves the, it proves the cost improvements of what you do if done properly. Now this is what you'll see in your practices during your practice lifetime. On the left is an artificial intelligence tool. It collects the data, it collects baseline data on all patients. It has between 98, 99% complete data, and it has millions of data points behind it. On the right side is a predictive calculator. In this case, it's spine fusion from a spine registry. And what you see is the patient characteristics on the left have been identified by artificial intelligence to be the characteristics of failure. This patient's characteristics guarantee failure no matter who the surgeon is. So your surgical skills are irrelevant here. It's the patient's characteristics that drive the message. And the right-hand side is a calculator that uses the artificial intelligence data for calculation. And what it tells you is that you have a 13% likelihood of successful treatment of this patient. And in a properly selected patient, you have the, the, the uh, dramatically higher success rate. So it allows you to tell your patient, you know, there's some characteristics about you that are modifiable. In this case, uh, the modifiable characteristics are the patient smokes, the patient uses opioids, and when you look at the pain scale, it's only five out of 10. The patient is not very severely affected by the condition. So this is the wrong person to operate it. This is a person who's coming in saying, Doc, I want you to fix me, I'm not so sore. 
but I use narcotics even though I'm not so sore. I smoke even though that's destructive to fusion. So you can have a conversation with the patient around, you know, this, this type of operation is of no use to you because you're guaranteed to fail. The same thing you can do with spinal cord stimulators, uh, RFA, hip replacement, knee replacement, the registry tool is agnostic of the procedure you're doing. It gives the same insights wherever it's used. And you can predict. This is a paper uh, in, published in JAMA. Two months after uh, some of our business uh, icons, uh, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos from Amazon, and uh, uh, Diamond from uh, Morgan Chase, uh, came out in the Wall Street Journal and said, we need to bring big data to bear on medicine because the costs are out of control. And we had already had the paper in press uh, before they came out and said that. The tool that you looked at, the predictive analytics tool, is represented by that paper. And registries deliver on that tool every time they're used. So remembering, although each of these P's, the six P's of registry, the stakeholders, the physician, the patient, the payer, they all have self-interests. If you collaborate and balance those, those self-interests, you can make a win for every one of those stakeholder groups by enrolling in registry. And my recommendation for uh, your generation is wherever you have a chance, engage in, enroll your patients in registry, participate in it, and you will get reports that will guide you toward the safest, most beneficial, most valuable treatment you can provide your patient. Thank you. Glad to take questions. Well, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, any particular questions? I didn't see any questions so far from the... Uh... So I find that Holophone effect incredibly interesting. Uh, Holophone effect? So one of the comments from the audience was the Hawthorne effect and how interesting that is. But it's, it's, um, it's, it's a, a, every mother knows this, that if you show an example of something done properly and you put it side by side with something that just made a mess in the kitchen, the behavior of the children will come around to doing it properly. And all of us who are type A uh, physicians always want the very best we can deliver for our patient. And when you hang up dirty laundry in public, you immediately change your behavior. So I use this with my, uh, my colleagues. Uh, we have ambulatory uh, surgery capabilities and we own our own site. So I run uh, side by side uh, and I show them this. The uh, cost of doing their uh, partial knee replacement or their total knee replacement, uh, the, the tools that they use, because they, they were trained by their eminent professor at the Mayo or at UC San Francisco or wherever they came from. They all came from different places, but they all have their eminent professor who they model their behavior after. But when I show them side by side by side that this knee replacement at $5,000 is being compared to this knee replacement at $8,700, and here's your initial post-operative pain score, here's your initial uh, uh, hoose or coos outcome score, and this is what they look like two years later, and there's no difference. Excellent outcomes in both of those. And I turn to the 8,700 implant colleague and say, okay, you spent more money and got the same outcome that your partner got spending less money. And then I shut up and I just leave the question hanging. A year later, everybody's using the, the $5,000 implant and they've forgotten about the $8,700 implant that didn't have a measurable cost-benefit relationship. And it's the Hawthorne effect. You don't have to ask them to change. You just shine the light. Hey, did you know this? This is the, the shoulder widget you use to anchor the rotator cuff tear. Do you know that it has no different outcome than the 
old school way we used to do X, Y, or Z. And so uh, it's a, the Hawthorne effect is wonderful because it's not coercive. It's merely shining a light in a room. And that's what the registry does. It brings the, the, the information to view for everybody. So the registry has triggered a few things afterwards, the US registry and the publication of it. It has, it has. Just to bring our listeners and viewers up to speed, could you give kind of a, a statement of impact for the US registry, uh, given the fact that it's the world's largest, and then some of the positive spinoffs that we've had since then? So the, the, the question from the audience was to reflect on the impact of the U.S. Uh, vertebral compression fracture registry uh, for, for cement augmentation of elderly women's osteoporotic fractures. And the, the impact of the registry is uh, one of the intended consequences of transparently reporting the embrace of all of the different ways of doing things, the heterogeneity of care for all of the different uh, people who have the disease. So many of them are uh, elderly women with osteoporosis, but there are a lot of other people in there of different age groups. And what it did is it showed that all of the different companies who make these devices successfully treat the problem. What it showed, and that helped the payer and remember that the participants in the healthcare system are payers and purchasers in addition to, so a purchasers are your Amazons, your Microsofts, your Boeings, your, because they, the Wall Street Journal article, Bezos, Buffett, Diamond, those purchasers want to keep their employees working. And what happened with the payer, in this case Medicare, the Medicare administrative contractors, they were regulating and restricting women coming in to get these procedures because they believed in an article that was published in 2009 that was a, a sham trial article from a respected uh, institution. And they believed that there was validity in that, uh, that argument. And, one of the Medicare contractors came to us and said, would you please build this registry so that we can see truth about the coverage that we have to provide beneficiaries and show me the evidence. And so this evidence is the world's largest. It's twice as, as big as the, the Swiss registry, which is the second world's largest. It has changed Medicare's opinion on national policy. And it is impacting other countries around the world who have the same question around what should be done. And the greatest insight it has for all of these stakeholders is it shows you a way to establish a clinical pathway towards success, measure all of the different ways that people can travel down that pathway, and identify the ones that have the greatest impact at the lowest cost which is huge for policymakers. Another one of those six Ps. Policymakers want to make the right decision. And this information changes national policy. Great, thank you. Okay, well thank you very much.